Hi, Liza. Hi, Bob. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm okay. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright of Blogging His TV. You are Liza Mundy, uh, author of a number of things. You're, you're a staff writer at the Washington Post. Yes. I'm currently on leave, on book leave still, and I'm a fellow at the New America Foundation. I'm very familiar with that foundation. Yes. And uh, you are the author of, well, first you're the author of Everything Conceivable, which doesn't mean you've written all possible books. It's actually <laughs> the title of one book. Right. And you also wrote a book uh, about Michelle Obama titled, fittingly enough, Michelle. Yes. But we're here to talk about your new book, Richer Sex, How the New Majority of Female Breadwinners is Transforming Sex, Love, and Family. Um, and before we're done, I want you to explain to me how threatened I and other males like me should feel by what you're describing here. But first, why don't you tell us what you're describing here, what, what's going on? Okay, so just describe first and then threaten. Yes, threaten, no. yes. Okay. Lull us into a, a false sense of security. I will. First. I'll try to lull you into a false sense of optimism. Okay. Here. So the trends that I'm describing are the, the increase in women's economic power, um, both absolutely and relative to men, uh, despite the fact that there is still a gender wage gap, and that's why it seems it may irritate some people that I call the book The Richer Sex, but I think that rich has a lot of connotations, actually. Um, uh, so despite this gender wage gap, the, the percentage of women who are out earning their husbands um, has, has risen steadily over the past two decades since the government started tracking it. It's kind of interesting that the government does track it, but they have a table for it, and they seem to consider it something worth tracking. Um, and if you look at the percentage of working wives who are out earning their husbands, you see that it's gone up from 23% in the 80s to uh, close to 40% now. And that's a pretty striking percentage, I think. And at the same time, we have a growing percentage of women who are breadwinners in their households by dint of the fact that they're single moms. So we have um, kind of two different populations of women who are the majority earners in their households. And I try in the book to talk about the reasons why this is happening, both the changes in our economy, but also the real strides that women are making, both in terms of the education that they're getting and the payoff they're getting to their education. I think this is, by and large, a good thing for women. I also try to argue that it is a good thing for men in that men, as a result of this, have more options going forward in terms of their own lives and their own life choices, that they don't necessarily have to be yoked to an identity as breadwinner and, and yoked to a job or a career that they don't want simply because they're obliged to support a partner and a family. Okay. Now, how much of this, you mentioned choice and possibly opening choices, but how much of this right now, what's already happened, is, is in some sense due to choice, like as opposed to necessity? So, for example, how much of this is happening at lower income levels and, and may have to do with, say, the fact that some of the kinds of jobs – uh, that less educated men used to do are not so available. Right, that's true. I mean, definitely part of this is the result of changes in the economy and the fact that the sort of high-wage jobs that used to be available to male high school graduates, you know, working in factories, making good, often union wage, these jobs are on the wane. So it, it certainly is true that both, you know, poor women and working-class women and working class women have really improved their own situation in terms of college education and college degrees and upped their college going. So even as women have improved their position, because these high wage factory jobs were not so available to them ever, really. Um, so women have improved their position. Men's position has um, has deteriorated. Mm -hmm. So it's true that in some cases this is not a function of choice, um, but more a function of the fact that you could argue that women have prepared themselves for the new economy in a way that's, that men have not. But, you know, even, even if you look at the working class, I mean, the thing that I keep getting back to, these changes in our economy were going to take place anyway, you know, the movement from an industrial manufacturing economy to more of a knowledge economy. So let's say that women in the working class had not upped their college going, had not increased their position relative to men, and were, were yoked to guys who were having trouble being providers. 
would that be better? I mean, would that be better for women? I know it's not an ideal situation if women are becoming single moms because they just don't see um, a pool of, of attractive mates out there. That's not a good thing. We need to fix the situation for men, but I don't see how it would be good. And, and obviously, you're not arguing this, but um, if if women didn't have these new economic advantages, um, if you if you can follow that, uh, I mean, I'm sure you can. If, if I'm making sense, um, and but but this it, it it used to be many years ago that breadwinning was a function of poor women that that a woman whose husband was sick or or disabled or just couldn't hold a job that these were the women who were breadwinners but um but that is that's no longer true in that increasingly among among middle class and upper middle class women this is certainly becoming a phenomenon and you know when you when you look at this category of working wives well who's most likely to work educated women are most likely to work. Um, you know, stay-at-home moms actually tend to be less educated and less affluent. So this category of working women uh, and working wives who are outering their husbands certainly includes um, middle-class and upper-middle-class women as well. And how, how often do you see the kind of, what I would assume is a kind of unusual case, where um, both, of, both husband and wife, let's say they're very well-educated, both could be out there making a whole lot of money, and they both just prefer the situation where the woman is the one uh, bringing home the big paycheck and the man is, is staying at home. Well, I mean, that's, cert that's certainly happening. I don't know if you looked at the cover of The New Yorker this week, but it's a, it's a young woman with a stroller entering an urban park full of dads with strollers. Okay, so that might be a little bit of an, of an overstatement, but, you know, in fact, there are an increasing number of young men. I mean, here's what we know. We know that um, thanks to a report done just recently by the Pew Research Center, we know that young women have higher expectations for earnings and professional careers than young men do. We know that young men want to spend more time with their families and that they are spending more time with their families. So um, I think, you know, increasingly this is becoming a choice. And and one of the uh, sort of linchpins of my reporting in my book, I interview lots of different women and men in this situation, but one of them is a family from Michigan, the Hawkins family. And what's interesting about them is they are a family of six adult siblings who were raised by a breadwinning dad in the 1960s and 70s, classic breadwinning family raised in the Detroit suburbs. Dad worked at Ford, didn't graduate from college, didn't have to in the 60s and 70s. And now five of those six siblings in adulthood are in female earner households. Three of these are, um, are heterosexual marriages, well-educated spouses on both, you know, both men and women. And the men felt so squeezed by their workplaces, so racked by overwork, that they made the decision, they... They, they, they approached their wives, they made the decision to become the secondary earners, the, the either stay-at-home dads or secondary earners. Um, they, you know, in, well, one of, one of them um, who's a, a stat in the financial uh, arena was um, working about 70 hours a week, had two young children, didn't want to work those kinds of hours, said to his boss, you can't have me for 70 hours a week. His boss said, okay, you can work for 40 hours a week until you find another job. So he ended up leaving that firm and really enjoyed being a stay-at-home dad. And two of the other uh, husbands just voluntarily made the decision that their workplace was asking too much of them and they wanted to be um, more involved with their children than, than their workplaces were permitting. Mm -hmm. And I would assume that there's like a whole, a whole lot of people uh, who are kind of in an in intermediate category. In other words, it's not because on the one hand, the husband... Uh, just can't uh, just just can't find a job, and they need to put food on the table. And it's also not totally a matter of choice, but it's the kind of middle class, upper middle class situation where they don't absolutely need to make a total of one hundred and forty thousand a year or something. But they've made choices about whether it's where their kids are going to go to school or whatever. They've made lifestyle decisions that have gotten them into this situation where they're both working pretty hard, and maybe the woman's making a little more, but. Uh, is it, I assume that's a very common thing. Yes, and there's some there there's some couples in their forties and fifties where you know they've been sort of on track achieving at the same level, and and the wife has found herself pulling ahead in in a way that neither of them expected, and that can actually be disconcerting for both the husband and the wife. 
And, and, and other, another situation would be um, a woman I interviewed in Michigan who got a great job offer from Chrysler, so her husband moved with her. I mean, he enabled her career, uh, compromised for the sake of her career, so she became the leading spouse, he became the trailing spouse, and then it was hard for him to penetrate the Michigan job market. So, I mean, obviously, it, it, it can be quite hard to keep two careers moving forward at the same pace, particularly when children become involved. Um, and... And so any variety of circumstances can propel the wife to become the higher earner, sometimes without really anticipating that that's what's going to happen. Okay, so it's your expectation, I gather, that the trends that have been driving this are, are, are going to continue to a point where uh, it is typical for the woman to be the, the breadwinner. Is that right? Yeah, I think that's entirely possible. I mean, right now we have a situation where, as I said, um, young women seem to have higher aspirations in terms of professional career, more ambitious, and in terms of earnings than men do. Now, interestingly, the Purdue study also showed that they have high expectations for marriage and having children as well. So th this generation of young women does seem to be under the impression that they can have it all. This generation of young men does not seem to be under that impression. These guys were showing, you know, less... Uh, ambition in terms of, or less, lower expectations uh, in terms of marriage, children, and earnings, which is kind of, I don't know, maybe, maybe they're a little bit depressed about this. But, you know, when you look, obviously, no one can predict the future, absolutely. Uh, but if you look at the trends that are, that our economy is changing, moving toward a knowledge economy, um, that, that fields like healthcare are the ones that are expanding, that traditionally these have been women's fields. And the fact that women are 57% of college and university students, and that's projected to go up to 60%. Um, I mean, I tracked out the graph, the, the, the Bureau of Labor Statistics table, you know, from like 23% to almost 40%. You know, and if you if the line continues to rise, then by 2030, a majority of working wives would out earn their husbands. Will that happen? I mean, it, it definitely depends on the economy. What's interesting to me is it also depends on young women and whether they're willing to embrace this. Um, because I think young women find it maybe a little bit scary. That's what young woman, one young woman said to me looking at the title of my book, you know, this is scary. Um and I, I interviewed a number of young women whose boyfriends and husbands were willing to invest in their careers. One law student whose husband was working as a carpenter to put her through law school the way that wives used to do for husbands. He was investing in her earning potential, and she was very grateful for that, very ambitious, fully embraced the idea of being the higher earner. Um, but I interviewed another young woman who's a, a Ph.D. student, a mechanical engineer in um, Atlanta. Her boyfriend was in the same Ph.D. program, and he was feeling discouraged with his program, she was looking at some great job opportunities. He was saying, "You know what? I'll move to California with you if you if you want me to. I'll invest in your career. You you know you go, girl." And and she said to me, "You know, she was looking at her life going forward, thinking, is this really what I want?" And she said, "Getting boxed in as the higher earner sounds like a lot more work and a lot less play." So I mean, young women could back away from this. I I can definitely imagine that. Um... But, but, but uh, young men may want to back away from that's, it. That's the reason I can imagine it, because I'm living it. I know, I know. I mean, I talked to couples who were literally arguing over, okay, which one of us gets to be the entrepreneur with a cool career, working at home, pursuing what we want, not making so much money, and which one of us has to be yoked to the workplace uh, and, you know, get up and go earn the paycheck every day. So it could be that spouses will be, you know, fighting over which one um, has to be the higher earner and which one gets to have this sort of freedom and flexibility. Yeah, because the days seem to be pretty much over of working at some company that feels it has a paternal obligation to, to keep you employed, you know? Uh, and, and, and so it's it's a little bit of a high wire act to be responsible for the, um, you know, tuitions and stuff. Oh, the, the tuitions, that's right, and the student debt. I mean, I think ideally we would see a day where couples can trade back and forth. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, with this young woman I described, she was thinking, okay, if we move to California and I get the job as the higher earner and I am working all the time as a consultant in failure analysis, she was looking at. Um, and maybe he then would figure out what he wanted to do. Maybe he would get a degree in a different field. Maybe he would earn up as the, you know, end up as the higher earner farther down the road. Uh, that would probably be the ideal situation for, for many couples. Okay, so in terms of how people are adapting to this, 
Uh, I mean, there are lots of uh, reasons that people would predict a failure to adapt, uh, largely having to do with stereotypes about men and women, you know, uh, some of which may be valid and some of which may not. But why don't you tell us, uh, well, why, why don't you start out with, say, uh, a stereotype that doesn't seem to be holding, and, and, and an area where you might have predicted a real difficulty in adapting where where you see cause for hope. Okay. Well, um, you know, I think women have been told for a long time that if you get too much education and if you become too successful, um, you will be alone and lonely for the rest of your life. Nobody's going to want to marry you if you're successful. And a lot of markers are suggesting that that is no longer the case. I mean, for women with a college degree, the chances of being married are greater than they've ever been before. A hundred years ago, if you were a woman with a college degree, you, you likely weren't going to marry. Now you likely are going to marry. And men tell researchers, when, when, when men are asked, what are characteristics, what are criteria that are desirable to you and a mate? Men put much less importance on domestic skills, much less importance on virginity, and much more importance on financial prospects. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, much, much more importance on financial prospects in a partner. So men have gotten the message that earnings and education in a partner are, are actually desirable. And, you know, that high-earning women and high-achieving women don't have to be ashamed of this, and they don't have to be afraid that it's going to mark them as, you know, old maids for the rest of their lives. So I think that's a good thing. Um, I mean, again, I think men have gotten the message that it's a good thing to have a spouse who has the earning potential and, and potential to succeed. Um, but do you want to know about the, well, other other Go ahead. Aspects? Yeah. Finish I mean, that <laughs> sentence. That, that sounded like an interesting question in the making. Well, I want to well, know about what women don't seem women don't seem to have gotten the message that that, that high earnings uh -huh. and are, um, are are a good thing. And I was I was really struck by the number of women, single women, who found various ways to hide their earnings and hide their success when they're on the dating market. Um, for example, in South Texas, I interviewed a university vice president who said that when she was on the dating market, if she would meet men and they would ask her what she did, she would say. I work at the university, and if they would ask what she did specifically, if she was a professor, she would say, no, I work in the admissions office. Um, and here, you know, here she was, in fact, a vice president at the university, and she didn't feel she could say that. And I interviewed a young woman who's a doctor in Pittsburgh who tells men that she works at the hospital taking care of patients. Um, so... I think women still worry that they're going to seem unfeminine or unneedy if they are, you know, homeowners at, at 25. Uh, but I think what was also interesting... Oh, go ahead. Well, wouldn't these women claim that they have uh, some empirical basis for this? I mean, I assume these women say, I've had the experience yeah, yeah, of a guy, do. you know... Uh, exactly. It's a mixed bag out there. Yes, because the woman in Pittsburgh said, you know, I just don't want them to walk away immediately. I want them to give me a chance. I want at least to be able to open my mouth and say some things before they walk away. And the university administrator down in Texas had, you know, encountered men walking her to her car, and she owns a BMW, and, you know, it was intimidating to them. Now, now this is a woman in a, you know, strongly Latino community um, where there's still a fairly strong tradition of macho, and yet these women are becoming college educated, you know, the, the, the gap in education attainment in the Hispanic community is even greater than it is at, in the nation as a whole. So I interviewed a lot of very high achieving Hispanic women who were maneuvering in a culture that still places a pretty strong emphasis on, you know, on macho behavior and on men as providers. So yeah, you're, yes, these women had had some empirical experience. Although I think also women are kind of leery of attracting men for the wrong reasons. If if a man might be attracted to their earnings, then they worry that he is the male equivalent of a gold digger, and um, and the women feel very skeptical and very uncomfortable about that. So um, more than men. Yeah, I mean, I can't speak for men. I'm sure that there are many. Oh, well, I can't. I can't speak for men who are in the position to worry that women <laughs> see them as a source right. of wealth. So we're, we're kind of we kind of have no data there. Um, the uh, now there is though in terms of of like well this may be relevant to men feeling threatened, but there's a a, a kind of memorable uh, stat in your book that men whose women's out whose wives out earn them 
are more likely to seek medi medication for erectile dysfunction. Yes, this is an interesting study that a, that a professor at Washington University did, a business professor, and working with a um, colleague in, in Denmark where they were able to access um, a, a database of, of prescriptions. And they, you know, they don't quite know what to do with this um, finding. Uh, but that particular professor is very interested in the impact of salary comparison on humans in general. And, and, and he has looked at you know, there's this field of psychology that looks at social comparison and the way that we kind of gauge our success by comparing ourselves to other people, you know, and, and particularly, it's particularly salient if it's somebody who seems like us and if they're in the same field that we are, that we can feel threatened by that kind of comparison. And in the workplace, um, I mean, it's known that, that people can become very threatened if their coworkers are earning more than they are, um, particularly if, you know, I, I, if I found out that another woman was earning more than I am, it might bother me more, although it actually would sort of bother me either way. Um, but so, so, you know, employers know that salary comparison can be extremely disruptive in the workplace, and it can make uh, coworkers mad at each other if someone is outdoing them and they feel that it's unfair. Right, but so. But I would think that's a totally different part of psychology than the part of psychology that governs whether you feel so threatened by your wife that you don't find her sexy or something, right? right? I mean, I mean that's right. good old-fashioned rivalry and competitiveness. Wait, which one? Uh, the, the, the thing at the workplace. We're naturally, yeah. you know, we all think we're doing better work than the person in the cubicle next right. door and deserve right. more money. Um, but... Uh, you know, I just I just would think that's 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 about a different part of the mind than the part that's governing your your relations with your spouse. Well, I think he was conjecturing that um, that the same rivalry and competitiveness now might be at work in some marriages and relationships because right, men and women used to be in separate spheres. I mean, we really weren't competing. The woman's sphere was the home, and the man's mm -hmm. sphere was the workplace, and we didn't compete in the same way. And and it could be that the only salary who, that you do know is the salary of your spouse, because your workplace is working so hard to make sure you don't know other people's salaries. So, it, you know, and he anecdotally had talked to female colleagues, particularly from other cultures, who, and I know this is hard to believe, who actually had negotiated, whatever they negotiated their own salary, they made sure that it was lower than their husband's so that they would keep peace in the home. And he even talked about something that I think is interesting, and I think it does come up sometimes, where women were opted out of the workplace by their husbands. I mean, they, they weren't opting out themselves. They were they were really being discouraged from working by husbands who didn't want that kind of competition. And, and I definitely interviewed women who uh, who had been pressured by husbands, generally ex-husbands, to uh, to stay at home and to not work. So. Um, yeah, he he is interested in, in in whether comparison and competition can can sometimes poison um, the relationship at home. But your your sense is that men more and more are are adapting to the yes. non traditional role yes. of not being the clear breadwinner. Right, right. And what, what was interesting to me when we were talking about adaptations. Um, I was really interested in reporting out how women are adapting to this new situation where they are better educated than the men in their peer group. I mean, young women now graduated from college at higher rates. Women you know, in their 20s and 30s are much more likely to have a college degree than a man is. So women are, are, are facing a, you know, a diminished marriage market in terms of men who are on their level. And a lot of women use that word, on, on my level. And so I would ask women who had gone to college, uh, would you marry somebody who didn't go to college? And and this was, you know, this was something that they were still getting their minds around and felt somewhat skeptical about, even as statistics do show that women are doing that, um, that a lot of women I talked to had trouble. They, you know, they, they see a college education as proxy for drive and self-improvement and uh, the desire to better yourself and, and the, the ability to have a good conversation. And they were afraid that if they married somebody whose degree didn't match theirs, that somehow the men would fall short. So one of the interesting, I mean, some women are adapting quite happily to marrying men who don't share their education level. But I interviewed young women in, in big cities 
And and we know now that, that single childless women in big cities make more than the men in their peer group. There was a big study two years ago that showed that. So I interviewed this woman, and what they're doing is traveling a lot. They If they're determined to meet a man who is on their level, and many women seem to be, they're jumping on planes. Women who live in Miami are jumping on planes and going to New York or going to um, Seattle or going to San Francisco. or I mean, to, to, to meet men? To, to meet men, yes. Yeah. Like, so well, what do they do? They, they get a hotel room for a week and go out at night or what? They, well, one young woman I interviewed in Miami who does this quite a bit, she goes to New York City, she goes to the Ace Hotel, which is this, like, techie um, Chelsea Hotel. I think it's Chelsea. It's Midtown, um, where, you know, people socialize with their laptops open. It's very high-tech. She says a lot of high-tech guys come there. And so, like, she has not only a Target City but a Target um bar, <laughs> basically, uh, where she goes. So I don't know. I mean, I think, you know, some are using match.com. Is, is her aspiration to just have a good time every time, or is she looking for the man of her dreams? You know, it seemed to be a combination of professional networking, like maybe meeting a guy who um, who could help her in her career, but also dating and just sort of going out and having a good time. Um, but but specifically leaving Miami is is pretty high among cities where women out earn men. Interestingly enough, and this woman was actually still an undergraduate, and she was working directing the social networking for her university, and she was making like seventy thousand dollars a year. Um, so she was way out achieving the guys in her university dating pool, um, and her school is majority female now anyway. So she had the money and she had the time. So she was just traveling to meet. I think guys who just maybe had a little bit more going on uh, in, in her in her view. So that was one that was one adaptation that I thought was interesting. Another interesting adaptation, as I said, I spent a fair amount of time in South Texas among a group of Latina women, and what a number of them had done was they married guys who didn't graduate from college, and then they made them go to college. So they basically had a fairly limited mating pool. They didn't want to move because many of the women are very rooted in their families are there, their parents are there, their grandparents are there. So they took the pool that they were sort of given and they set about making it better. Was this in San Antonio? No, this was in the um, Edinburgh McAllen area. Hmm. Um, that is yeah. south. Yeah, very south. Yeah, yeah. And it was something that came up over and over in women that I was interviewing. Um, because I, I set out, well, in, in sort of casting a net, I set out to interview women at schools who are recent alumni of schools that are majority female. And there is a university there, um, the University of Texas Pan American, that is majority female, um, majority Hispanic. And so a, a pool of well-educated, high-achieving, young Hispanic women, many of whom came from, you know, immigrant families. They had not had advantaged starts in life, and they had done very well. Lawyers, psychologists, school teachers, um, but they do have trouble. Often the men in that community leave uh, school after high school to get any kind of a job. So the women are ending up better educated, um, and I was struck by how many of them had, had married guys and then made them go to college. In some cases, it had not worked out so well because they said it was like having another child. Um, but in raise, raising another child. But in, in one marriage in particular, I spent time with this couple. It had worked out very well. And the husband really felt that his wife was an inspiration to him. And he had gone back to school. She had helped make that feasible. She was now going to embark on a doctorate, um, working in politics as well. And he was just totally supportive of her. And, you know, we recognized that on every level, she was the best thing that had ever happened to him. Now, is it possible that uh, in, 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 in looking at people who have, who have kind of made, made switches like this um, and seeing how it's working out, you're, you're looking at an unrepresentative group in the sense that you're kind of looking at the early, early adopters in a, in a way. I mean, you're looking at people who have, uh, in some cases, in, in the ideal case, chosen it. The, the, the man has said, you know, I actually prefer to take care of the kids and cook woman has said, I actually prefer to be out working. And, you know, it, when it's those people, you would you would expect that they're fine with it, but, but they may or may not wind up being representative of the larger populace. So they, they may not, you know, they may not be good canaries in, in the coal mine, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, that's certainly true. Although, as I said, I tried to cast a very wide net. Mm -hmm. I interviewed 
a lot of African American women who have been living this situation for a much longer time than women in general, in terms of being the breadwinners um, and being better educated than than the men in their cohort. Uh, I interviewed Hispanic women, uh, for whom this has become true more recently in terms of education, young women in their 20s at a variety of different universities, and then um, executive women like like the family in Michigan. Uh, so it's true that these may all be early adopters and that everything will play out differently. Um, but I figured all I could do was talk to a lot of different people in different situations. I mean, what's, what's interesting, you can look at two different models. You can look at African-American women who had been out achieving African-American men educationally actually since the 1950s, which is interesting. Um, you know, back in the 1950s, there was not much incentive for an African-American man to go to college because he wasn't going to get a payoff in the white-collar workplace. Those jobs weren't going to be there, but there were higher-paying industrial jobs to a high school graduate. So Black men would make that choice often. African American women face so much discrimination in the workplace that um, that going to college at least enabled them to be a school teacher. So women had an economic incentive to go to college even back in the fifties that men didn't have. Now that those industrial jobs have gone away and that men are so disadvantaged, um, many African American women are making the decision not to marry because they're not seeing you know a, a marriage pool out there that. That seems uh, promising. So, okay, that's one path. Um, but you can also look at same-sex couples. And you can look at the fact that same-sex couples have always been more willing to partner outside educational boundaries, outside class boundaries, outside racial boundaries. So if you're trying to envision how this is going to play forward, you could look at that as another, as, a, as another adaptive model as well. So you're right, all the interviewing that I did, maybe these are all just early adopters and it'll, it'll settle out um, some other way, but uh, all you can do is, 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 I think, try to find as diverse a pool as you can. Yeah. And I certainly found couples that it, where it wasn't working out well, um, sometimes to their surprise. What are the most common sources of that kind of uh, trouble? What are some of the most stubborn problems of adaptation? I think, you know, a female expectation that a man will provide economically on some level. I mean, I, I interviewed one woman who married a guy with, I guess she had a little bit more education than he did, but they were both college graduates. Uh, she had a medical degree as well. And they made the decision at the beginning that he'd be the one to stay at home because they didn't want to use child care and, and she had the better earning potential. She thought she would be good with it. She thought she would be fine with it. And she found about 10 years, 12 years in that she had lost respect for him, that she felt like he wasn't trying, that he wasn't moving ahead, that he wasn't developing in the way that she had expected. And she said, you know, I was really surprised by myself. I thought I was a feminist. I thought I was going to be okay with this and I wasn't. So it I think there is a lingering expectation um, on the part of women that a man should be bringing some some income to the table. Um, I mean, I, I I did wonder if women may have a little bit more problem adjusting than than men sometimes. Hmm. Uh, I, I was surprised at at the. Um, Another woman who, who said to her husband, she was fine with his being the stay-at-home dad, but the minute their kids left the nest, she said, you've got to go back to work. You've got to go back to school. You've got to do something. You cannot just sit around all day. And I think that, I think that you know, men who are married to stay-at-home wives are probably a little bit more tolerant if they want to continue, you know, pretty much that course, uh, maybe a little bit more tolerant of that. So, um the other, I mean, I, I felt like talking to women also that, um, that it raised new questions that I think feminism might be well advised to address. I, I for example, interviewed a young couple, both well-educated with masters, um, but he had been unable, he had lost his job and unable to find a new one in the recession. She was supporting the family. Um, they had to get married earlier than they expected, so he'd been on health care. She was suddenly thrust into this situation where she was the household provider and breadwinner. And she found that as a result of this pressure, she started working a lot harder. I mean, she wasn't that happy with her job, but she started really throwing herself into her work uh, in order to be able to, you know, pay the mortgage and keep the household afloat. She started getting better performance evaluations at work, becoming more successful at work. I mean, sort of the classic male breadwinner pattern, feeling that family provider pressure, really working hard, um, being rewarded. But she also then started asking herself, well, do my earnings entitle me to 
sit around when I get home at the end of the day. I mean, because we've always argued that men shouldn't be able to sit around at the end of the day, that earnings don't buy you out of helping out at home, that men need to change diapers, they need to be involved dads, and you can't just sit on a recliner in front of the TV. And she was kind of feeling when she came home at the end of the day, like she wanted to sit in a recliner in front of the TV, and like maybe she was entitled to do so. Um, so she was... She was having to revisit this question of whether earnings maybe do carry some entitlement when you get home. And this was a woman who had belonged to the Freedom from Gender Society at her uh, liberal Northeastern University. So, um, and she was also having a little trouble surrendering control over her earnings. I think for women, because so long our earnings have been supplementary, they've been pin money, they've been our money to spend on, you know, what we think is important to, to, to hand it over to the household um, is maybe a little bit of a sticking point. And she acknowledged that he was doing all the domestic work. Um, and she acknowledged that when he took their uh, animals to the vet and he authorized an expensive procedure, she said, it kind of pissed me off. And she said, I felt like you just spent a whole lot of my money without asking me. So she was still thinking of it as, as my money. So we still, I think, maybe have a little ways to go in terms of, of adopting a provider mindset. Right. Whereas the way you think she should look at it is they are collaborating in an enterprise. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if he's putting in as many hours as she is, he should have as much control. Right. And that was a situation where he was at home. He wasn't. Yeah, but still, I mean, if yeah, he's spending was, the time, I mean, the enterprise yeah. is the whole thing. The kids, the, the dog, the, the keeping the house up and yeah. mowing the lawn and yeah. bringing yeah. in income. The, um, so, and, and how often are women winding up with, with, with kind of the worst of both worlds in the sense that they're making most of the money, but the man still manages to sustain the expectation that since she is a woman, yeah. she will be more comfortable doing dishes and taking care of kids. Right. I mean, that's definitely the most problematic situation when a wife feels like she's, you know, it, it pretty much she's a working mother, that she's running all the time to get from work to home, and that when she gets home, the housework hasn't been done. So uh, it, I, I don't... You know, statistically, how often that happens, um, well, I mean, there, there's, a, there's a lot of data on time use. Um, but I definitely interviewed women for whom that was the case. Um, but we do know that men are doing more housework, and they are doing more child care. So I would say, you know, in many of the couples I interviewed, there was certainly a continuum um, but the men certainly were pitching in. And some of the women had trouble with husbands who seemed over-domesticated to them. Um, that, you know, this had been a reversal that they had not anticipated. And I, I, I spent time in Michigan interviewing women who had recessionary, who had become recessionary breadwinners. Mm -hmm. Their husbands had been the primary earner, had lost their jobs, and these women had either upped their own work hours or stepped into the workforce after being stay-at-home moms. And so in some cases, they were coming home to huge meals at the end of the day. Um, you know, their husbands had just embraced housework. Really, I interviewed a number of couples where this had happened, and the guys were happily cooking, and they were cooking really big meals, and the women were coming home, they went, oh, just can't you make a salad? Um, so they were kind of, um, they were a little bit taken aback by, um, by the fact that their husbands actually had embraced the housework. They may be the early adopters. Those men may be the early adopters also. Yeah. Now, what about the early child rearing years? I mean, I think, you know, if you ask, say, evolutionary psychologists, whom I know you may be skeptical of, but if you, you ask them, what's an area of behavior where you would expect a pretty deeply rooted difference between genders? I would imagine that taking care of a child who's weeks old or months old or, or a year or two old would rank pretty, pretty high. Where they might they might say that mothers are just better built for this, and I can attest that I mean there I, I specifically remember a time when I was holding my older daughter, and she just wouldn't stop crying, and I really I really felt like throwing her through a window. I mean I mean and you think women don't feel that way? Well, I'm sure they do, but if they if they if they felt like I did, there would be very few children that would live. Too old to be old enough to reproduce. I mean, you know, we may be an extreme case, but my wife certainly had infinitely more patience with um, with that kind of thing than I did. And that's that's you know that's that's just two data points. But I'm just wondering what you found in that realm, or how often you even found them trying to do the. Experience. 
experiment where, you know, with a four-month-old kid, it's the father who's going to stay at home and the mother's going to be out working. And, and then how often the experiments seem to be working. Okay. So the Michigan couples that I, um, you know, that I, I interviewed, uh, the, the men became actually stay-at-home dads a little bit, in most cases, a little bit later in the process. Although, you know, one of the women, she went back after each child after six weeks. And, and one of the things that I have to say I admired about these Michigan women is they did not complain. I mean, they, 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 there wasn't a lot of, oh, I wish I, you know, I wish I could stay at home. They just sucked it up and went to work. And they had risen really high in their corporations. And their husbands were so competent domestically and so good at running the households that when they got home at the end of the day, the housework was done. And they could enjoy time with their kids playing homework. And I'm sure those women recognized that they had made trade-offs. Um, you know, as I said, only one of them, I think, was in a situation where her husband really was doing the infant care. Um, and actually, they had, they had family health as well. Um, I mean, I don't think it's an either-or situation. I think that many working mothers, and I can speak for myself, you know, are, are really would prefer maybe a, a six-month maternity leave is a, is a whole lot better than six weeks. But, but I think most of us would say also that we don't want to do it alone and that this argument that, you know, that women are, are better at early infant care is really a slippery slope because if you don't get husbands in there involved at a really early stage, that it can become, you know, a self-fulfilling prophecy. And then you become responsible for the woman becomes the one who's better at all these tasks, even if she isn't necessarily better. So, I mean, in my ideal world, you'd both get parental leave. And, you know, the question of whether women got a little bit more, I, I don't know. I mean, it, in, in my perfect world for the early infant stages, you both get some some leave. And But I think many women would be very, very happy to see their husbands, partners uh, developing competencies, um, you know, it, it, at, when the child is very young. Because if it doesn't happen then, I mean, when is it going to happen? And, and then you end up living this life where you're always the go-to parent. As the, as the mom. Did, did you sense any difference between husbands and wives who were at the workplace with young, with young, very young kids at home in, in terms of the extent to which they felt torn? I mean, uh, you know, I've known, I've known women at the workplace who expressed ambivalence to me who weren't at home with very young children. I've known very few men who expressed that kind of ambivalence. I That's can't, interesting. I can't think of any. Because the data show that men are feeling more, working fathers are feeling more work-life conflict than working mothers are at this point. I mean, we know that young fathers are spending more time with their children. And the Families and Work Institute did this study, um, you know, tracking ambition and, and also the amount of time that they're spending. And they, they did find that young men were feeling more work-life conflict than young women. Um, so there have got to be some men out there who were feeling ambivalent. But, yeah, I mean, I think working moms certainly feel more guilt about the time that they're spending away from their child. Often your child is being taken care of by another woman. So, um, you know, men rarely have to confront the fact that there may be a, um, you know, a surrogate dad uh, spending time with you. Know, they don't have that tension, at least. I mean, I never, I, I, I really, any child care that we had, I, I loved the, the person who was helping me. Um, but... There can be a lot of other women involved with the child care and not necessarily a lot of other men. But I don't know. I In my workplace, I um, I feel like I am seeing some some very involved fathers. I don't yeah. know. I mean, the, the, the cover of the New Yorker this week has got to come from somewhere. Yeah, I was wondering, does it, I mean, this is the one you, you said with, with, the, with the, the woman with a baby carriage walks right. into a park full yeah. of men who have baby carriages. Could be all these like aspiring writers in Brooklyn, right? Yeah, that's right. That's, 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 right. that's, that's right. probably Park Slope, yeah. you know. Right. I think it probably is actually. And I did interview um, a young woman who lived in um, in New York and was commenting on, you know, the urban dads in the parks that it may be a particularly New York um, phenomenon. Yeah, I mean that's the other the whole other thing going on is that. It's in principle easier to work at home thanks to telecommuting, and and you know people in in our milieu probably do it quite a bit. I do it, and yeah. and that's so my experience has not been at all typical because for almost all of the uh, lifetime of my children, I was actually at home. 
But, you know, this is question of sort of the natural affinity for child rearing. One of the things that struck me with these Michigan fathers um, who are in their late 40s, I mean, they're not they're not like 30 something dads They're um, and, and they have done over the years a lot of coaching. And it did strike me that parenting involves not only these early years of diaper changing or infant soothing, but, you know, a lot of a lot of, of athletic activities and a lot of outside activities and a lot of varying of children to various activities. And like, why would that be a female activity? It strikes me it could be a more male activity. One of the, the fathers had turned all of his three children, including his daughter, into really crap golfers. So... Um, I'm, I don't know. It made me wonder if aspects of parenting are, in fact, more masculine than uh, th- at least the whole coaching thing. I mean, there are a lot of coaching dads out there. Yeah, there are. Uh, yeah. The the uh, so now the subtitle: uh, How the New Majority of you know, Breadwinners is Transforming Sex, Love, and Family. I guess we've touched a little on sex, love, and family now, um, but is there? more we should say. I mean, we, we talked about we talked about sex and men, at least to the extent of asking whether men feel threatened by by a by a kind of um, high achieving woman in a way that makes her less sexually attracted to them. Um, you but you write in the book uh, a certain amount about the, the the approach of women toward sexuality in light of of this kind of changing balance of power. Right. right. Yes. Yeah. I do. Um, And I I have to say, it was hard. I I tried to talk to researchers in sexuality, you know, about if the the premise is, and this is evolutionary psychology for, among others, you know, if the premise is that women are attracted to men who are strong, manly providers, capable of providing or protecting, um, and, and if the woman becomes the provider, then how does that change, you know, sexual dynamics and sexual attraction? It was kind of surprising the number of people who just, hadn't looked into that. I mean, you know, it just wasn't a question really that that people were asking yet. Um, but there is this argument being made that collegiate hookup culture is a function of all these well-educated young women who outnumber well-educated men flinging themselves at this dwindling pool of well-educated men with the hope that a man will commit to them. And that that's what it's about. It's it's women engaging in sexual encounters that they don't necessarily really want to engage with because they still somehow want men to commit to them, and that's how they're going to get it. You know, the idea that sex is a transaction and that the men are the ones who want the encounter and that the women want to get something out of it and that what they want to get is commitment. I mean, that's... that's they want to get something other than the pleasure for themselves. Than, that's right. That's right. That's right. And the women that... I mean, the, the data suggests that young women, particularly educated young women, are actually not interested in a hasty commitment to um, a sexual partner, that they're interested in getting married, but they're interested in getting married maybe in their late, 50, late 20s. Uh, they're not interested in committing right away. And the young women I interviewed in their early 20s did want to commit, but they didn't want to commit right now. And in, in a number of cases, they were having plenty of sexual partners because they wanted to, because they could, because they could pay their own mortgage and they could wait around for, for five or six years and, you know, and find a guy who was a satisfactory sexual partner and also a satisfactory domestic partner. So I, I guess I, I do reject the idea that women are somehow, there's always this advantage that women, there's always this argument that women, when they win are really losing, they've got to be losing on some personal level if they're going to be succeeding professionally. But there's doing something, something unnatural and some downside them. to it, some emotional downside. And that can be true, but talking to young women in their 20s, I wasn't seeing that emotional downside. I mean, yeah, it can be hard dating-wise if you're on a campus that's 60% female and they're just 40% guys. And women all seem to be convinced that half these guys are gay. They, they, that's what they that's what they would say. Yeah, there's only 40%. And, half of them, and I, I don't know where they got that idea. But I did get the sense that once they graduated and they were out in the work world, they were actually quite sexually empowered and that they weren't looking for a hasty commitment. So um, I reject that argument that uh, that's what hookup culture is about. Okay. 
And does hookup culture, this is just like a generational question, does it kind of make sense to you? I mean, <laughs> when I, right. I mean, when I first started reading about it, I just thought, it's kind of weird. <laughs> you know, I mean. Well, I, I don't know. I think the definition is very vague. I, I have teenagers who are coming in from school well, now. Maybe they can, maybe they can explain it to us. I don't know. But, but, me, but, um, but I, I mean, I got the impression that the definition is really quite vague and also that it's not really clear to me how it differs from the sexual revolution of the 60s and 70s. I mean, what was that? that was, right. right. That was in college, there was a certain amount of sexual liberty. Right. But, it, but it, doesn't, it doesn't seem like it was as casual as they're making it sound now. As systematically, yeah, casual. yeah, 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 yeah. That's probably true, right? right. And, and so it that seems would be like it seems like there was often an asymmetry of expectations, not always in either direction, gender-wise. But it just seems like it was the rare case that people would would have like a one-night stand, and then they'd both be okay, fine, that was fun, it's over, uh -huh. and and neither of them would actually have wanted something more. That that seemed like the the rare case, and now it sounds like. It's the default case, but maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think that is the precise definition. Um, and when I was on campus in the 1980s, I still felt that women were more judged um, if they were having, you know, uh, a non-committed sexual encounter uh, than men were. Okay. Well, uh, I guess if, if, if your kids are home, I mean, after all, you are the, you are the woman. And it is your job. I know. To take care of your kids. <laughs> no, they're all nothing. <laughs> they can. So, uh, but but even aside from that, I think we we've, we've talked for um, we're getting close to probably an hour. So, um, is there anything else you want to say before we wrap up about your wonderful book? Oh, thank you. I, I um, I'm sure there may be things afterwards I would have wished I said, but mostly I would just like to say thank you for. Uh, for for this time, it's great to talk to you. I'm my my pleasure. Congratulations on the book. And uh, and and continued good luck in overturning stereotypes. Oh well, thank you. That's a nice thing to say. Okay, thanks a lot. All right, bye bye. Bye bye.